humor has a a big role in giving people perspective and allowing them to bond together it's got a very big role in creativity uh, in particular Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, politics, and entertainment, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humor with you. Humorology is the study of how humor can dramatically improve your business and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast was a prominent political leader for more than 20 years, serving as Conservative Party leader, Foreign Secretary and leader of the House of Commons. In 2015, the Queen conferred on him a life peerage and he now sits in the House of Lords. Having known many global leaders with first-hand knowledge of the likes of Tony Blair, George W. Bush and Vladimir Putin, he speaks from rich experience about different styles of leadership. With the combination of true Yorkshire wit and natural comic timing, good humour is at the heart of everything he does. Due in no small part to his mirthful manner, he is rightly regarded as an exceptional keynote speaker and raconteur. He was even once hailed by Hillary Clinton as the David Beckham of toasting. William Haig, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Thank you very much, Paul. Great to be with you. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, when you were foreign secretary, you visited more countries than any other foreign secretary in history, which I believe was 83 countries. Did you find that humour helped get rapport and connection with people around the world? Well, it does help a little bit. You have to be careful as foreign secretary, of course, because you're dealing with very serious situations. Uh, you know, with war and conflict and refugee flows and so on. So humor is less appropriate uh, in the job of foreign secretary than in, than in most jobs. And you, you could watch when Boris Johnson was foreign secretary, he's a naturally humorous person. He almost had to teach himself out of being humorous. You know, you, you have to be more serious. Nevertheless, you know, that there are there are amusing things that happen. There, there, there was uh, one time at the United Nations Security Council where I witnessed another foreign minister read out the speech of the wrong country. He just picked up his colleagues. And, and he got well into this speech before he realized it couldn't possibly be his country that he was talking about. He was welcoming fellow Portuguese speakers to the um, to the council, and he wasn't a Portuguese speaker. And so you, when you're foreign secretary, things like that pass for amusing. You know, that that is not really a, it's not a sort of rip-roaring joke or anything. But things happen that you have to find amusement in when you're foreign secretary. And of course, yes, yeah, sometimes um, uh, humor diffuses a situation in a, in a private meeting. And uh, you know, you can enjoy a joke or sport together. You just mentioned Putin. You know, I, I took him to the Olympics. I hosted him at the Olympics in London in 2012. I did judo. Well, he's a big enthusiast about judo. So we were able to go and sit and watch the judo together and, you know, really enjoy the every time a Russian was was playing judo. They were always winning. We now know, of course, subsequently, all the drugs that were being used to ensure they won. Um, but uh, our relations were better. Our relations with Russia were better that day than they've <laughs> ever been before or since in modern times, I think, because we were enjoying a more jovial occasion together. So does Putin have a, a great sense of humour when it comes to sort of uh, more sort of when he's doing something he enjoys, like judo? Well, it, yes, in the sense that, uh, yeah, he, he's a, he can become an animated person in those uh, circumstances and was certainly very happy, you know, when the uh, 
when as soon as a Russian won a gold medal, he he was over to them to kiss them. They didn't look like they really wanted to be kissed by their president, but <laughs> he was rushing over to embrace and kiss them. And uh, Putin, he really laughed and smiled a lot. And uh, you know, we had champagne, and his his aides all looked like they were really sort of thank heaven that the the Russian won because we weren't going to go back to Moscow until a Russian won. Uh, and now he's happy, and and he was really genuinely, you know, patriotically and personally happy about it. So even to leaders like that, um, who we disapprove of in so many ways, there is a human side, and you can have a um, some human connection with them. Do you think that humor humanizes people generally, in your experience? Um, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yes, it is part of the way we relate to each other. You know, I think I think humor has a, a big role in giving people perspective and allowing them to bond together. It's got a very big role in creativity uh, in particular. You know, here I'm, I, I, I'm digressing a bit here into something else. But, you know, when, when I was um, preparing for prime minister's questions against Tony Blair, um, which I did hundreds of times. I used to have a team of people working with me, um, well-known people uh, subsequently, Danny Finkelstein, uh, George Osborne uh, were my team. And a lot of the time we were actually coming up with humorous and ridiculous things that we couldn't really deploy at Prime Minister's Questions. You know, one time we were, as Christmas was coming, we were saying, well, we could ask Tony Blair, does he believe in Santa Claus? Because if he says yes, the headline will be Blair, age 48, still believes in Father Christmas. And if he says no, the headline will be Blair ruins Christmas for millions of children. So we've got him, you know, he can't say yes and he can't say no. Now, we couldn't really ask him without me looking ridiculous, does he believe in Santa Claus? But it triggers a train of thought, um, which, well, what are all the other things we can ask him, which are much more serious, where he can't say yes and he can't say no. And so we will have caught him uh, on the, you know, we'll have got him in a difficult situation on the floor of the House of Commons. So um, to me, uh, humor is very good at, um, almost, at creating serious thoughts. It, it actually helps your brain onto other matters. It, it encourages lateral thinking really, particularly when you're in a group of people. So it helps creativity, essentially, if you have a yeah. lightness in the room. Absolutely, because the mind enjoys that, of course, and, and, and something that your mind naturally enjoys and takes part in um, actually helps everything to flow. Um, and so provided that humour is appropriate and is not offending anyone, well, then it, it's, um, it helps everybody in the room to take part in what's going on and gives them a connection uh, with each other. There's no doubt about that. We had uh, Alistair Campbell on the, the podcast and we were talking to him and I actually have a quote from him. He's got, he said that William Haig was so funny in the House of Commons with his dry one-liners, we worked out this was his biggest strength and we had to try and disable it. Were you aware that they were trying to disable it? I, I had a little bit of awareness because there was, um, after about 18 months of these question times, there was a leaked memo, a leaked Downing Street memo that uh, basically said, you know, Blair was sending out a message to his staff of, help me, and uh, we need new ways of dealing with Prime Minister's questions. And his way of dealing with it became to suggest that um, you could be good at jokes but have hopeless judgment. You know, that, so that he always had an answer. Uh, to, and that was probably, in political terms, a perfectly effective answer. But it didn't stop me um, making jokes at his expense, partly because I didn't have much else going for me. You know, I was uh, way behind in opinion polls. My party was in ruins after the previous election. And also, it was my way of making somebody who was very powerful look a little bit ridiculous uh, at times. And I regard that as being in a, in a great British tradition and a great democratic tradition. 
that it's important. The more powerful somebody is, the more we have to have a bit of irreverence uh, towards them. And uh, also, it was it was one way of undermining him on, uh, on his own side and making them laugh at him. And again, when somebody is so important and powerful, it's just too tempting uh, to do that. So, um, you know, I, I um, when I used to say things like when he was having a terrible uh, time with the mayor of London and I said, well, why doesn't he split the job and have Frank Dobson as his day mayor and Ken Livingstone as his nightmare? <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the Labour MPs themselves laughed about that, and uh, they were laughing at Tony Blair as well as at the. And, and this, um, um, this is this can be effective. Of course, it's very important to add that humour on its own isn't effective. That um, you know, it is in support of other things that you're talking. If you're making a serious point, it helps people to notice it and remember it, but. You do have to have, as, as, as Blair would have pointed out, a serious argument as well, uh, underlying the humour. Well, I, it's interesting that you go on about the pricking the bubble of pomposity, because I think that sort of thing. We, I was recently speaking to on the show uh, Rick Wilson of the Lincoln Project, um, which, uh, if you're aware of in America, was the Republicans who came together to get rid of Trump. And they used humour in a very, very cutting, or well, they weaponized wit, essentially. Do you think that works on every level? Or, I mean, there are obviously some places you can't use that. Well, I think it works a lot in, in democracies, um, particularly those with a, um, with a good tradition of humour in, in public life. And uh, we are certainly one of those. And... You know, we, we, I am really, um, my favorite period of history is the 18th century. I've written books about, you know, about William Pitt the Younger, who was Great books. prime minister then. Um, and there's so much uh, humor and irreverence directed in those days at political leaders, even at the royal family, uh, much more... Uh, much ruder, much more vulgar cartoons and press commentary than we experience today. Um, you know, really very, sometimes very sexually explicit cartoons and so that we would think was unacceptable today um, in the mainstream press. Uh, and so um, uh, we've really got the history of that in this country. Uh, and I think it's one of the reasons we have a healthy democracy, actually, because um, it, we, we couldn't take a dictator seriously. Uh, we would have made pitiless fun of them before they got to the position of having too much power. And so a uh, Republican with that, with, with Trump, who loved being, taking himself so seriously and, and, and uh, claiming to have so much power, this was a completely fitting thing to do in America to, um, to, to make fun of him. So I think it works on most levels in policy, you know, it, it, in terms of the levels of seniority, it can work at most levels. Um, again, uh, humor has to fit with the, with, the, with the standards of the time, you know, with the um, society changes in the humor that it finds acceptable. Um, and so uh, political humor always has to be within the, within the parameters of what society finds humorous at the time. But there's lots of scope there in any age to, to puncture the pomposity of an over mighty leader. Yeah, I think that's really uh, important. And uh, I, you've written two award winning books um, about William Pitt the Younger and William Wilberforce, as you just say, which I advise all our leaders to look and read. But it, it's an extraordinary story, especially uh, William Pitt the Younger, that um, he became prime minister at 24 years old. Was his ability for humor? Uh, part of the reason why he could do it at such a young age? Um, well, certainly it was an important attribute of his that he didn't take himself too seriously. Um, that, be, that even though, of course, he had to show being prime minister in his 20s that he was a very serious figure, not an immature figure. And so his, um, his speeches in parliament were absolutely uh, very serious and momentous. Nevertheless, behind the scenes, he retained a very playful attitude. He still enjoyed 
Uh, well, he enjoyed a lot drinking with his friends, which is one one reason he died uh, rather early. Um, but um, you know, he could he could mess about. He could he could um, you know wrestle with some of his friends. He could uh, join in blackening somebody's face and someone to to annoy them and make fun of them. It was um, you know within the that's how people had fun at the time sometimes. So. Um, he well, he was somebody who didn't take himself too seriously, and I think that is important in a leader. Is that not important in any aspect? Never mind just politics. In in life, is that not important that you don't take yourself too seriously? Well, uh, yes, personally, I think so. Yes, yes, and um, it does apply to politicians uh, who vary greatly, of course, in their um, in whether they have a natural uh, sense of humour. But the ones who, who do have some humor to diffuse a situation, to make a connection, to make a point memorable, uh, do have an extra advantage, I think. Yeah, I think it's another level. Um, I really do. So, William, what makes you laugh? What makes me laugh? Um, well, as a, if you're doing something as serious as foreign secretary, you are reduced to laughing at somebody reading out the wrong speech, as I just um, uh, mentioned, which, which wouldn't normally count for most people as being a hilarious uh, thing. Um, what makes me laugh in terms of, if I'm watching a movie, what makes me laugh is something like The Life of Brian. You know, uh, again, it's the, um, it's, it's the puncturing of a, of a lot of serious uh, talk, really. Um, or so my favorite film, one of my favorite films is Zoolander, you know, about the models. Oh, yeah. of, uh, you know, and again, again, it's it's a similar thought, isn't it? It's puncturing something very similar, where they're all sitting around saying, there's got to be something more to life than just being really, really good looking. Uh, so I, I really like those sorts of, uh, of films. Otherwise, you know, I, what always made me laugh as a member of parliament was encounters I had with my constituents that were just very genuine um, encounters. People coming to my constituency surgery, not meaning to be funny, but uh, somebody once walked in and I said, what can I do for you, uh, madam? And she said, oh, I'm just looking. And uh, I said, well, what are you looking at? This is not a shop, you know, this is my advice surgery. And she said, no, I thought I'd just come down here and have a good look at you for 10 minutes. And she sat there having a good look and then she went away. Um, but you don't expect somebody who's gonna come in that's not a shop and say, oh, I'm just looking. Uh, and things like this always amused me. And um, again, it keeps you down to earth if you have enough connection with people who do things like that, that um, you can't take yourself too seriously. Well, I, I think that's good. I, I remember hearing a speech you made once where you told a very funny story about getting a letter from uh, a constituent. It said something like, I hope you can uh, take some constructive com uh, criticism of your uh, recent speech. Uh, it, it was rubbish. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's what a Yorkshireman thinks is, a, um, is constructive criticism. Yes, I hope you can take some constructive criticism of your recent speech. It was rubbish. Uh, but my favourite letter I ever received uh, was just, just said, Dear Mr Haig, the Taliban have taken over Anne Widdicombe's body and no one has noticed. And, the, and that was the end of the letter, that you're sincerely, uh, whoever it was. And the thing about letters like that is somebody has taken the trouble to write to put a stamp on, you know, write it out, put a stamp on it and um, send it. And they know that it's just a joke, that you're, you're going to open it and just laugh. And um, it's just a ridiculous thing. Um, but it's a good world where people will take the trouble just to write out a joke and send it to somebody they've seen on the news. Oh, well, I, the whole point of the Humorology Project is that you can shift people's states by bringing a bit of levity rather than gravity into the world. And, and, and so that kind of thing I love, you know, just sending something like that out of the blue is, is beautiful. Um, I've seen you speak and you are very, very witty on stage. Um, I just asked you what makes you laugh. Have you ever considered like trying stand up or something like that? Because you, it's a, it's something you have a natural talent for. No, I don't. I don't thank you for that. That's nice of you to suggest another career for me. And um, 
no, I mean, I've always enjoyed doing after dinner speeches, which is probably what you've heard me do, um, yeah. which I started up when I was in my 20s. I would do that, you know, for a charity event in South Yorkshire. Um, so I got into the habit of doing that. And then I used to do that sort of thing a lot around my constituency at uh, whatever, the local Rotary Club and uh, charity dinners and things. I never imagined I would end up getting paid for that. Uh, eventually, when I left government, um, yes, people used to uh, hire me to speak at their dinners, uh, sometimes serious and sometimes humorous. And I enjoyed all of that. But I've always, I'm lucky, I've got lots of, I've always had tons of other things to do in life. So I don't need to set myself up as a professional comedian. Also, I'm not sure I would be good enough to do that. I think um, you need a constant stream of new humor to be a, um, a real stand-up comedian. And for me, most of my stories are about, um, they're about things that have happened to me. Uh, some of the things we've just been talking about as a member of parliament or as foreign secretary. But they're not sort of, you know, a great joke. They're not, um, here's a here's a um, new up-to-date joke about something happening in society now. They're recollections, they're anecdotes. And so I don't think I could make a whole um, life's activity out of those. Is, are there any stand-ups you particularly admire? Oh, there's some that I know who I really admire. I did a few sessions on Have I Got News For You a few years ago. Uh, and I have such admiration for Paul Merton on there, you know, I, so I, I take my hat off to people like that. To quite a few of the people who are on quiz shows uh, now, actually, uh, like David Mitchell. And so I'm, I'm quite a fan of those people. No, no, I, absolutely. I mean, Paul Merton is a great friend of mine and we we sort of grew up in the comedy world together in the, at the comedy store and everything. And I still think that Paul is one of the most naturally funny, naturally gifted. And uh, it, there's lots of people who think that, you know, they get writers in for the, the, have I got news for him? But that is all Paul's mind. And you've been there. You've seen it. It is. There are writers in there who help with the host and so on to you know, prepare the programme. But yeah, then most of that programme is um, spontaneous repartee. And you have to be really careful about it. You have to really be uh, on your wits when you go in with those people. Well, you're paying in the big leagues then, aren't you, really? That's a... Is everyone funny, potentially? Well, I don't know about potential. Not every, not everybody is funny in their daily um, dealings. You know, if I think of politics, um, Margaret Thatcher was not funny. You know, that, that was not her approach. She was, in my view, an extremely impressive, brilliant person in so many ways. And everybody would, whatever their political views, would say she was a very major figure in history and an important leader. But she wasn't funny. She didn't um, react that very well to humor because she didn't really get it. And um, she would enjoy having an argument. She'd enjoy having a discussion. Uh, but whereas many people, as we've just been discussing, would inject some humor into it to help it along, that just wasn't her approach at all. Um, so, you know, you can be successful without humor but um it does create a pretty serious atmosphere around you and you'd better have some other massive attributes uh if you're going to do without it but they did actually bring in um writers for her when she did the big set pieces at the conservative party conference and and she somehow did manage to get laughs as well didn't she in in set pieces she did but she didn't really you know, she delivered the lines and, and, and uh, they explained to her, but there was one, um, I can't quite remember the detail, but it was, a, it was a Monty Python allusion in one of her speeches. And, you know, then apparently she said, well, this could, we must get this Monty Python into, you know, give us some more <laughs> ideas. Uh, so she hadn't really understood what it was all about. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, so yes, she could be persuaded to use some 
some humor, but she just wasn't a naturally humorous person. And um, maybe it showed you can't have everything. Uh, but um, she would have been an even more impressive, but she, she would have um, got her way even more often, probably, uh, if she'd also been able to carry people along with a bit of humor. Uh, well, yeah, I just got this image of her going, get me that Monty Python on the phone. <laughs> It's just, it's brilliant. Um, do you find yourself funny? Um, uh, I don't think so. I hope I, I get you. Um, I think humor is most effective when you when you don't actually assume that you are necessarily a humorous person, because otherwise you can get carried away with it. And, and actually have the fault of taking yourself too seriously, funnily enough. Um, it's very important not to assume that uh, just because you're intending to be humorous, that other people are going to find it humorous. So I think, as with anything in life, you have to cast a very uh, self-critical eye over anything and, um, uh, and preferably test things out. Uh, sometimes with uh, with humour. Of course, if people are doing stand-up comedy or if they're doing after dinner speeches that I used to do, you do test things out. You do, and then you um, you use it again a few weeks later if uh, if it's been successful. Um, so no, I I don't um, uh, I don't sit there thinking, oh, I'm a really funny guy. I can make humor out of anything. Um, you have to work at it. Uh, actually, you have to work at it for public humor. And, um, and, and, and it's, but if you're going to be humorous in private and enjoying jokes together, it's best if you're in a group of people who are all feeding off each other. It can't rely on one person's humor. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, you are obviously use humor a lot to great effect in speeches. And I get brought in as a psychologist and former comedian to uh, help leaders, CEOs and business people to, to deliver their speeches. And one of the things I have to do is I have to stop people wanting to do humour when they don't have the ability to do it. So, so what would your advice be for people who are making business speeches, for instance? Well, I think my advice for a business speech or, or any sort of speech is... Um, the main thing to decide is what is the message of your speech, the serious message of it, and um, and to have a clear structure of your speech so that people can follow the argument. And then you put the words around that. It's only like, it's like building a building. You need the foundations, you need the structure, then you put the bricks on, and that, those are the words. Well, then when you're at that stage, it might be appropriate to decorate it with some uh, flourishes, or it might be appropriate to draw particular attention to some part of your structure uh, with something that is that turns out to be quite humorous, but it has to be built on it. It's not like, okay, we've got a speech and now we've got a joke that we happen to know. So we'll stick this joke into the speech. Well, no, no, it, the, the, the humor has to arise from the speech. Um, and so it's, it's not just that you happen to know something humorous. So my advice is to think of it that way. So the humor should develop out of the serious uh, situation. And there will be some situations that are so serious, they're not appropriate for humor. You know, I mentioned being foreign secretary, you deal with so many situations of life and death, um, people wouldn't like it if you were humorous. It's, it's, not, it's not appropriate. There will be business situations like that. But in the majority of day-to-day -day situations, um, it can draw people's attention to something, help them to remember something, um, break the ice in a meeting, get people to relax. Uh, if you do bring in appropriate humor, um, so one example, sorry, this is a long answer to your question, but oh, um, one of the things that um, uh, I, I once gave a speech in the House of Commons when they were discussing having a permanent president of Europe about um, how horrified Gordon Brown would be as prime if Tony Blair became president of Europe. And it was a description of, you know, Brown biting his fingernails as Blair sweeps into Downing Street as president and 
and so on. Um, and the point of that, it was a serious speech about the dangers of having a permanent president. And then the, 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 the humor arose from imagine if it was Tony Blair. Um, now, uh, people, that's still on YouTube or what, you know, people still tell me that they still watch that and laugh at it. But they would never have heard about my speech on the president of Europe or remember it now if it hadn't had that humor. Um, equally, the humor is not just a joke about Gordon Brown. You know, it's, it works because it's connected to the argument that I was making. But it, it takes it to the next level, doesn't it? It makes it memorable. And also, I would argue from a psychological standpoint, I'd kind of go to the Maya Angelou. People don't remember what you said to them. They, they remember how you, you made them feel. And yes. if you've made somebody laugh, you've actually made them feel joyous for want of a, a, another word. So you've shifted their state. Do you, do you think that's yeah. true? Well, yes, I think that's right. You're put, you've studied this much more than I have, so I haven't really thought about it like I think you're right, yes. The way I think about it is that um, if you want to hold an audience's attention, you have to get them to do things, you know, because, of course, faced with somebody talking, one person talking continuously, people's minds drift off. Uh, the human brain wasn't really, didn't evolve for that, to just sit you know, around the campfire listening to the same person for an hour. So therefore, if you're going to impose on that brain this long monologue, you do have to liven it up for them to keep them engaged. Now, that can be from getting them to applaud or to cheer uh, or to cry. But it, it very often, the best way of doing that is to get them to laugh. That re-engages them. Uh, gives them some connection with the speaker and it gets their attention back. And so I often tell people if they're going up to be selected as a, as a parliamentary candidate, for instance, and they've just got 10 minutes to give a speech to a group of people they've never seen before to get them to vote for them, I say, well, you make sure that every 90 seconds you get that audience to do something. Um, it might be to laugh, it might be to clap, but they will remember you they've got to try to remember 10 different people who appeared before them for 10 minutes and if you get them to do something every 90 seconds they will remember you so that that's my i think that's my way of saying what you were just saying that that's brilliant and that's going in the book basically that is no no it really is uh, you'll get a credit don't worry uh, but it, that is because I, funny enough, when I speak, I do exactly the same, but I hadn't actually um, verbalized it in that, uh, that sense of getting people to actually do something. So it becomes a kinesthetic and then that they internalize it uh, on that basis. Um, and I think that's br absolutely brilliant. It's funny because I was uh, doing... Uh, a little bit of research from you, and you made a wonderful speech um, for Hillary Clinton. And you said that actually, when she was Secretary of State and you were um, in the Foreign Office, um, she said, I don't think we have enough fun around here. Um, how do we get more fun? And I'm very interested that businesses need to be more fun. So even at the level of, of state negotiations how important is fun in that it's it was a nato meeting I, th I think we'd been about eight hours sitting at the same table you know nato like the eu the nato ha nato has um nearly 30 countries um 29 is the latest number so when you have a meeting of the foreign ministers they all want to say something. Well, imagine if you have four or five different topics and 29 people all want to say something. And they're all very serious subjects uh, in a military alliance. Um, well, then you get, when you've been there about eight hours and uh, you're all jet lagged and in a strange country, of course you feel like it is a human thing to think we need to relax a bit. We need to look at the world in a slightly different way. Um, the United Kingdom always sits next to the United States, alphabetical for alphabetical reasons at, um, at such meetings. 
Um, so yes, Hillary, I remember her leaning across to me and saying, William, we need to have some fun because uh, we've been here eight hours and so on. And um, she said, why don't we go out for dinner? And um, uh, we'll just have a more social time. So, uh, so we did and we, 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 we did that several times. And um, she, I enjoy a couple of glasses of red wine at the end of the day, and she would enjoy a, gla- a couple of glasses of red wine. Um, and of course, when you do that, just to, like in the business world, you talk about a lot of the business you've been doing, but you also ask about each other's families, and you also tell them a story about you know something you were doing the previous week and some funny recollections of previous meetings. And um, that is part of part of diplomacy, uh, actually. Uh, it's, it's an important part of that. But you sort of have to artificially create it these days uh, in all these serious meetings. For all business people, for any business, whether you run a cafe or you, you actually run a, a multinational, I think it's absolutely crucial that there's more fun. So if I asked you to write a business case for humour, what would you include? Right. Well, I would include, um, I'd, I'd include the need for creativity. I think we've discussed that, or I gave an example from uh, Prime Minister's questions, um, that um, serious creativity is often assisted by humorous creativity, um, as long as it's led and... and um, uh, in the in the right way. Um, secondly, I would say humor is important for creating uh, bond, mutually supportive bonds between people, people who will go and do something extra to support their colleague. Are often people who have shared um, a good time. They've had a drink together. They've they've had their dinner together, or they've. You know, they've exchanged stories together. This is this is how the human brain works. So it's important for creativity. It's important for the bonds between people. Um, and I would say it's also important um, if, if you take it away, um, you can then see that something is missing. Um, and and in a way, sometimes it's easier to notice something by its the effect of its absence. Um, And I think we're seeing a bit of that now in the pandemic. Some of the organizations I work with, I've really noticed what what, what the staff of them are missing now. Is humor, is they're missing their fun. Like just like Hillary Clinton said, we don't have enough fun. After a year of doing everything on Zoom, all that interaction that you would have around your workplace, telling each other stories, um, say you never guess what happened to me on the way home last night, or you'll never guess what my dog just did, or all these sorts of things. That's we've lost a lot of that, and people have started to say uh, in recent weeks, we need to put some fun back into our work. So they've noticed the absence of it, and um, uh, it, it's it's when you it's like. You know, when you're suddenly missing important food from your diet or something, or you're missing sunshine from your from uh, your holidays, you really notice it when it's not there. So that I think that's part of the business case. Yes, it's the Joni Mitchell factor, isn't it? Big yellow taxi. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. Right, exactly. Yes. That's one for our older listeners, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, but I completely agree. Uh, th- th- you work a lot with big businesses um, all over the world, so y- you really understand this. How do we make this clear to the people, the bean counters, who actually that th- there is a need for humour, and how do we tell them that there will be a return on investment? <laughs> well, it's hard to measure the return on investment, isn't it? You know, you can do that if you're a professional comedian or if, like me, you had a time giving after dinner speech. You can literally measure the, you know, by the fee you receive, the uh, return on the investment for humor. But that is not normally possible. Um, and um, it's just part of a, a healthy organization. Uh, and um, just as so many things are, uh, you know, of, of, of 
of an organization encouraging good physical health among its staff, um, of it providing good terms and conditions and facilities and um, ensuring that there, there are proper complaints procedures and all of this sort of thing. It's also part of having a healthy organization that People, people are encouraged to do the things we were just talking about, to be creative, to have social bonds, um, and to, um, um, to, to get the human brain working in the right way. So I don't know how we persuade people. I think it's, um, you know, I, I think it's just a very strong argument. So you will have to go around in your work working out how to persuade them all. Otherwise, the best thing we could, the rest of us can do is set an example. Uh, and um, when we're at our serious business meetings, you know, there is a role for um, some of the time. There, there is a role for human, and there's certainly a role for um, having in human interaction a, um, an atmosphere in which appropriate humor is part of it and is encouraging people to converse and to give their views and to react to each other. Um, this is this is part of being a successful organisation. I think you actually touched on the return on investment when you said the word healthy. We encourage people to be healthy. So automatically, if you encourage people to be healthy in body and mind, humour helps the health. You have less absenteeism, for instance, which is uh, a straight return on investment, isn't it? Yes, it is. And health, there is that uh, mental and physical connection, of course. Um, it's, uh, it's another part of what I was saying about get an audience to do something physically. That is in order to keep their brains engaged, even though it's their, it's their hands clapping or their, um, their mouth laughing. That is the, that, that's what they're doing. But really, that's then connected to their brains and it's keeping them engaged. So if you have an organization where everybody has to sit head down at their desks and, uh, you know, pretend to be utterly serious, um, as opposed to one where they feel free to congregate together, to have their breaks, to get to go out for a walk uh, together, situations in which they will naturally tell each other stories, um, well, you will find that that's a healthier organization that's uh that, that it's a physical difference but it leads to a mental difference have you ever taken a joke too far and crossed the line or are you very good at holding yourself back and being in control i think i'm i'm actually a very controlled person so um you know, I, I, I don't. Th thankfully, I've not had too many, um, you know, gaffes with humor, and no. um, I, I don't think so. Anyway, I'm just trying to think. But the, um, I think you do. We all have to recognize that what is humorous in one decade isn't necessarily humorous in the next one. And you know, twenty years ago, a story about Englishmen, Scotsmen, Welshmen, and so on would have been humorous, and um, now that's not really acceptable anymore. Um, and we just have to go with it. Society changes um, and our own view of what is acceptable humor changes along with that, of course, if we're sensitive people. So um, uh, it's important to flow with that, I think, not to not to fight against it. So, I mean, do you think this is, these are natural cycles? Are we ever going to go back to a time that William Wilberforce's time or Pitt the Younger's time? whereby it is anything goes in sense of humor again or do you think where that's it it's getting whittled out i think there is a cycle to it um I, that doesn't mean it goes right round back to where it was no. uh before um but I, I i imagine there is a cyclical aspect to it so people might think uh, slowly the humor is being drained out of everything um, but it isn't actually, I would be more optimistic than that about humor because it's so innate to the, um, to a, to the healthy human condition that we were uh, talking about. And it's just a case of respecting people's sensitivities. Um, but, you know, there are still, um, well, all the things we've just been talking about, about um, uh, in parliament and in government interaction and uh, speeches and so on. Humor is still entirely appropriate. So um, it will survive and it will, it will continue to play a big role in our lives, hopefully. From your mouth to God's ears. Yeah. Um, 
have you ever gotten yourself out of trouble by using your humor? I've seen, um, uh, it's not so much getting out of trouble, but I've, I've seen diplomatic situations where a bit of humor makes a dramatic difference to a tense situation. I remember on a visit to Brazil as foreign secretary, I sat down to a big lunch with the governor of uh, one of the state, Rio State, I think in uh, Brazil. Um, lots of people, and the governor said, uh, well, before we even have our meal, we have to discuss with you uh, the war, the Falklands War and uh, Britain's attitude. And so and I thought, oh, no, we're in for, a, you know, the Brazilians are going to say the Argentinians were correct and uh, give us a hard time and so on. And then the governor said, so just when we all looked through, the governor of Rio State said, uh, why did you stop? Uh, he said, my quarrel with you is you should have kept going in the Falklands <laughs> War. And, um, and, and immediately all the ice broke that, that you could suddenly see the Brazilians were really saying, you know, well, we're kindred spirits. We know that sometimes, uh, you know, our neighbors have misbehaved and uh, everybody relax here. So it was, it was a very successful diffusing of the situation. My apologies to anybody in um, Argentina who's sensitive about that. It's just, it's, it's actually what I call teasing and chiding, really, which I think should never be lost in humour because I think it actually bonds people when you tease and chide with them in a nice way. So I think that that should always be acceptable, but that's my personal opinion. We come to the part of the sh end part of the show. Uh, it's gone in a flash. Um, this part of the show is called Quick Fire Questions, William. Quick Fire Questions! So, question number one. Who is the funniest business person that you've met? Oh, well, they may be quick fire, but they're not going to be a very quick answer. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> the funniest business person that I'm, I'm trying to think of some of a, uh, who would who would be the uh, let me come All right, back. Let, oh. Okay, let's let's take it another way. Who's the funniest political person that you've met? Well, the one who inspired me with humor was the late John Smith. Now that's not to say that it was funny every minute of the day, but that's you know, uh, understanding what we've been discussing. He could use humour very effectively in the House of Commons to uh, undermine the other side, my side. And um, I learnt a lot from him. So in the political world, uh, he was very effectively funny. What book makes you laugh? Oh, what book makes me laugh? Well, uh, do you know the 1066 and all that? The... Um, the fake history of, I mean, this, I'm going back 50 years in- uh, No, not really. In reading, that, that's a book that makes out, there are only two dates in the whole of British history. And one of them is 1066. And the other one, people have mainly forgotten. And it describes history in that way. And okay, I know it doesn't sound very funny, but when I was a, a child, I used to really, I used to find this quite funny, that there were only two dates in the whole of history that were worth remembering. What word makes you laugh? I think umpty buggerus, uh, <laughs> which, uh, which is a Yorkshire word, really. I think it's a Yorkshire word, which just conveys the idea. You can, you can almost think what it just, if you, if you never heard of it before, what it might mean, umpty buggerus. It's just somebody who is going to be a bit awkward, a bit cantankerous, and is just trying to make things, has a, a slightly wicked approach to something and is just going to muck it up slightly for the sake of it and um that, it's it's i, it's I find just, that quite an appealing yorkshire idea and, and it's a word it's a very expressive word umpty buggerus umpty buggerus could you use umpty buggerus in a sentence please william <laughs> Well, you say, uh, the reason you're not agreeing to my idea is that you're just being umpty buggerous. Perfect. I love the word. And I'm going to be using that now all the time. Um, taking a shift to the other side, um, what is not funny? This is related to what we were talking about, isn't it, about appropriate humour. And um, that something that is uh, understood to be racist or sexist is not funny. Um, even if many people would have found it funny some time ago. 
So, um, so yeah, there are a lot of things that are not funny, um, but particularly things in that those areas. Yeah, and I know that you have a, a marvelous initiative, the Preventing Sexual Violence uh, Initiative, and uh, jokes about that. I I would, you know, balk at anything that involves that. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's an ex- it's an extraordinary initiative and people should uh, look it up and uh, support it. Would you rather be considered clever or funny, William? Well, there isn't a contradiction between the two. Um, you know, the two largely go together, I would say. But the um, so I, I'm, I'm in a way I'm refusing. It's a politician's answer. I'm refusing to make the, <laughs> the choice. But um, I think uh, it's pretty important to be clever. But you will get much further if you're funny as well. Well, uh, my belief as a psychologist is that in order to be funny, you have to be clever. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, which is not true the other way around. That that is absolutely true. So, uh, so you're going for clever, uh, with a hint of funny on the side. I think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And finally, William, desert island gags. I know you've already done desert island discs, so desert island gags. You can only take one joke with you to a desert island. What is it? I th- it's my story of um, going up over, a, going to see a farmer in my constituency up a long drive and over a cattle grid, another drive, more cattle grids, finally getting there and saying to the farmer at the gate, um, you've got a long drive, haven't you? Just to make conversation. And he said, well, if it were any shorter, it wouldn't reach. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's just my little one line story. <laughs> no. I've always enjoyed telling it. Uh, and it's lovely and it's going with you to the desert island William Haig you've been an entertaining wonderful guest thank you so much for being on the Humorology podcast thank you great pleasure thanks a lot the Humorology podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks music by Steve Hayworth creative direction by Les Hughes and additional research by Helen Sykes Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.